Laughter is poison to fear. A quote from uh, George R. R. Martin, who is definitely well acquainted with all three by now. Thank you all for being here today. I'm James O'Hearn, and I'd like to argue about humor. It's been a part of the journalist's repertoire and the writer's repertoire for years, something I'll certainly be covering, but it can often be dismissed as unimportant. A pleasant amusement, a diversion, nothing more. To my mind, there are few, few tools more powerful. Works of great drama or tragedy affect us deeply, but for me at least, many of the times when a written work has truly changed my mind on something, truly expanded the way I think about a subject, it's been with satire or humor, turning oneself upside down to see it all from a new angle. Having said that, I'd like to bring up my first point. It is the responsibility of the journalist to not merely provide truthful information, but to engage the readers so that thoughtful interest follows. In my internship last summer with uh, KXL Radio, for example, in my hometown of Bakersfield, it, I had the pleasure to work with a pair of hosts who understood the value of humor. It was certainly no average working place unless I've seriously underestimated the number of offices that regularly involve philosophical discussions on the metaphysics of Star Trek. For the record, the continuity of mental substance means that yes, the transporter is in fact perfectly safe. Dr. McCoy may be a doctor, not a magician, but um, he's clearly no philosopher either. I could hardly go over every instance of using humor as an outreach tool, but I can sum it up well enough, I believe, by stating that the experience did an excellent job of encapsulating the theological idea of joyous laughter. It is an amazing thing to watch people laugh, the way it sort of takes them over. Sometimes they really do struggle with it. I see that in church often enough, I'm sure you have as well. So I wonder what it is and where it comes from, and I wonder what it expends out of your system, so that you have to do it till you're done. Like crying in a way, I suppose, except that laughter is more easily spent. Much has been made of the idea that Jesus is never said to have smiled or laughed, especially at Biola. <laughs> Linked to the description of the servant as a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, it has sometimes furnished a basis for the idea that Jesus' life was unremittingly joyless and stressful, an oversimplification that often goes unsaid. An idea that sticks in people's heads so strongly that the idea of Jesus laughing hardly seems to grind against the grain. Apart from all else, a joyless life would have been a sinful life. Would Jesus have been guilty of the anxiety he forbade in others, or of the precept to rejoice always? Could he have been filled with the Spirit and not yet know the Spirit's joy? Grim care, moroseness, and anxiety, all this rust of life ought to be scoured off by the oil of mirth by we writers. Mirth is God's medicine. There's many verses on laughter, certainly, and uh, no way I could ever cover them all with the time I have. Theologically, I hope it's obvious that it is to be a part of the Christian walk, and I see no reason why I as a writer should not work to use such in my own work. Now, if there's one type of journalistic writing that leaves me utterly apathetic, it's dry, newsy pieces that rely on their content to sell themselves and not the voice of the author. I have no doubt that this sort of thing is necessary on some level. Perhaps it is too much to expect every piece read to be engaging. Making an obituary such, for instance, would be rather difficult and is likely frowned upon regardless. The literary journalism class I took in my sophomore year, however, certainly showed me what I was missing insofar as that sort of writing goes. But what's the point? How can it be used effectively? What are some examples of how it's been used effectively? I'm glad I asked. That brings me to my next point. By subverting the reader's expectations with humor and satire, biases that would normally not be reached can be overcome, hitting harder in the long term. Before I move into satire, I must address one of the many so-called laws of the internet, this one being Poe's Law. The core idea of Poe's law is that a parody of something extreme can be mistaken for the real thing. And if a real thing sounds extreme enough, it can be mistaken for a parody, all because parodies are intrinsically in stream, if you haven't noticed. This can also happen to someone whose picture of the opposing position is such a grotesque caricature that it renders them unable to tell parody from reality. A similar notion was named the Harry Golden Rule by Calvin Trillin. The Harry Golden Rule, he said, properly stated, is that in present-day America, it's often very difficult when commenting on events as a writer of the day to invent something so bizarre that it might not actually come to pass while your piece is still on the presses. I'm sure we've all noticed such in uh, the current political environment, which is sweet manna for us political satire writers and I'm sure much less enjoyable for everyone else. All this comes together to make satire, and more broadly, humor in general one of the absolute hardest things to write. Examples of really brilliant satirists are a rare and glorious thing. 
Satire is, of course, hardly something new. One of the earliest satirists most people think of when asked is Jonathan Swift and his modest proposal on solving the food crisis by eating Irish babies. That's the sort of humor that's followed by silence, or at least a, a, an uneasy chuckle. And hopefully in said silence comes thought. Subversive humor is one of the greatest tools I, as a writer, hope to have. It can be a spectrum as well, from the stinging Swift to Swift's type of satire being obviously political. But I would still classify the writings of Douglas Adams in his five-book trilogy, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, as satire, if a satire on the human condition. This sort of thing can be seen in the author who has perhaps been more influential on my life than any other. Sir Terry Pratchett's Discworld series contained 41 books all by itself, not to mention such eccentricities as the apocalyptic romp, good omens, and the like. Humor can sometimes be considered a sort of ghettoized genre, like fantasy or science fiction. If I'd told someone when I was younger that, you know, I want to be a fantasy writer, or I want to be a sci-fi writer, or I want to be a humor writer, they might have said, what? Why? Get a real job, you bum. It's an idea that, yes, it can be amusing, you can even have really good fantasy writing, but even then, if it's fantasy, or if it's satire, or if it's science fiction, it's not real writing, it's not a real book, it's not high art. It's a thought to be less than serious fiction, serious here meaning of any intellectual quality. I can think of no better defense of satire and fantasy than Pratchett's own words on the subject. He said, fantasy and satire are without a shadow of a doubt the er literature, the spring from which all other literature is flown. The national literature, the one that underpins everything else, is by the standards that we apply now such works. Now I don't know what you'd consider the national literature of America, but if the words Moby Dick are inching their way towards this conversation, whatever else it was, it was also a work of fantasy. Fantasy is a kind of plasma in which other things can be carried, as can satire. I don't think this is a ghetto. This is, fantasy is, almost a sea in which other genres swim. You have to be fairly dense to think that Gulliver's Travels is only a fantasy story or a satirical story about a guy having a real fun time among big people and little people and horses and stuff like that. What the book was about was something else. It can carry a serious burden, and so can humor. So what I'm saying is strip away the trolls and dwarves and the jokes and the wit and things and put everyone into modern dress, get them to agonize a bit, mention Virginia Woolf a few times, and there, hey, I've got a serious novel. But you don't have to actually do that. Terry Pratchett died last year. It is, I think, the only time I've ever cried over a death. These works of fantasy, these works of satire, these and others have contributed more to my beliefs about the world, the way I think, than anything else. It's one thing to say, I don't fear death, but to laugh out loud somehow drives the idea home. It, em it embodies our theology. The best satire does not seek to do harm or damage by its ridicule, unless we speak of damage to the structure of vice, but rather it seeks to create a shock of recognition and to make vice repulsive so that the vice will be expunged from the person or society under attack, or from the person or society intended to benefit by the attack, regardless of who is the immediate object. Whenever possible, this shock of recognition is to be conveyed through laughter or wit. The formula for satire is one of honey and medicine. Far from being simply destructive, it's inherently constructive. And the satirists themselves, who I trust concerning such matters, often depict themselves as such constructive critics. I mention the verses of the death of Dr. Swift, for instance, here reading, as with a moral view designed to cure the, ver <laughs> to cure the vices of mankind. His vein, ironically grave, exposed the fool and lashed the knave. Yet malice never was his aim. He lashed the vice, but spared the name. No individual could resent when thousands equally were meant. His satire points at no defect, but what all mortals may correct. Satire, indeed, like all literature and poetry, must be intellectually rewarding, be reasonably well written, and must entertain in order to survive. In the particular case of satire, in order to be received at all, no one wants a satire that you can't laugh at least a little bit about. I'm sure people watch the news, but then who do they watch? They watch Stephen Colbert, they watch Jon Stewart, they watch people who can make them laugh and present what's going on in the world as a representation of what things really are through the lens of that humor. In the words of that old philosopher Swift, as wit is the noblest and most gift useful gift of human nature, so humor is the most agreeable. And where these two enter far into the composition of any work, they will render it always acceptable to the world. Men's vices are a threat to the civilization in which the satirist lives. 
and he feels compelled to expose those vices for the society's own good and his own. As I believe one of the quotes I passed out mentioned, good satire comes from when you're angry about something, from when you see something in the world that's unjust and makes you want to go, hey, that's wrong, but I don't want to just yell about it. How can I make people see this in a new way? How can I make people see this in a different way? How can I open their eyes? Satire must be presented in a manner which will bring action. Secondly, going back to that first one, it must be engaging writing. You can't just read it and go, yeah, I guess that was all right. Good satire makes you go, wow, I have never thought about that way before. I've never even looked at that way before. It's looking at truth, not in terms of painting something, something flat and two-dimensional, but as a statue from which you can move around, you can step around, you can see all the different angles. Satire moves your perspective, moves your camera, and gets you a new angle. This may be done gently, this may be done sharply, but always its purpose is to bring men into a new light in men's own vision. Augustine certainly is more weighty than Lewis, but I learned more from the screw tape letters than I did the confessions. Thomas Bay's theorem on rational thinking with probability has done less for me than Eliezer Yudkowsky's fanfic of Harry Potter that used it. I adore Plato. I mean, I love him to death. Tory student here. But the image of humanity that I hold is more closely aligned with Douglas Adams than anything in his works. Laughter is not just something that engages us, but something that makes us think. How important this must be. And we should consider every day lost in which we have not danced at least once. We should call every truth false, which was not accompanied by at least one laugh. Laughter connects you with people. It's almost impossible to maintain any sort of distance or any sense of social hierarchy when you're laughing with someone, when you're howling with laughter. Laughter is a force for democracy, a force for the news, a force for journalism. Humanity has unquestioningly one really effective weapon besides God, laughter. Power, money, persuasion, supplication, persecution, these can lift at a colossal humbug, push it a little, weaken it a little, century by century, but only laughter can blow it to rags and atoms at a blast. Against the assault of laughter, nothing can stand. As a student at Biola, suffering is clearly nothing new. We here sometimes fall into a rut of expected behavior, falling over ourselves to better fit the common Christian mold. But soon I will leave and will be in the world. For every young man and woman, for every old man and woman that the world has heard enough dry and dusty writing, I will write. At times the desire to write feels like fire in my veins. Maybe you felt that as well. How can I write something that will inspire people, that will get them to think, to give them perspective, that thing that seems so rare now and in truth always has been? I can only say in conclusion that in my experience, laughter and wit opens more minds than any other key. Thank you very much for giving me your time. It's been a pleasure.